Welcome back to AAKP's annual patient meeting. My name is Paul Conway and I serve as the Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for AAKP. In this next panel, you'll learn how patient insight data and research is being applied, applied through innovation, regulatory policy, and future research. Our first speaker is Zach Cahill from the American Society of Nephrology. Zach has been a friend and an ally of AAKP since 2015, when he was first starting out at ASN and coordinating our Capitol Hill visits in partnership with ASN. He serves as the Senior Artificial Kidney Specialist for ASN and is very enthusiastic in taking the concepts related to patient insights and actually creating an architecture for private sector interests and investors to understand how patient insights and human factor engineering can be applied to the next generation of medical devices, whether it's dialysis or artificial kidneys. Zach is very insightful. His work has been published in CJSON and other outlets. And we encourage you to listen closely and download his article and take a good read on it. Zach is a true patient advocate and we're honored to have him today. Go right ahead, Zach. Thanks, uh, thanks to Paul Conway and Stana Clients for the invitation to talk today. I'm excited to talk to you about how ASN is thinking about um, how the patient consumer can influence product design. So the theme of this meeting is about patient consumers and how they can influence innovation and technology development. And I'm going to look specifically at product design and human-centered design and some work that we're doing at the Kidney Health Initiative around that concept. So these are just my disclosures. Um, my role today is as uh, an artificial kidney product specialist. That basically means that I'm involved in promoting and supporting and coordinating all the different stakeholders that are involved in developing alternatives to conventional dialysis. And uh, today I'm going to be focusing on part of my job that's around non-technology considerations for adoption and sustained use of new technologies that will be the future of kidney care. So to set the stage, I'm going to go through a couple of steps, starting with this concept of the patient consumer. It's really helpful when we um, think about how the direction where we want innovation in the kidney community to go, because being a consumer implies choice and preference and that product developers need to pay attention to you or they risk you not choosing to use their product. So these are all things that are foreign to the kidney community. And historically, we have not had a lot of choice in the different therapy options that people with kidney failure have. And there is a lot of movement now and a lot of good work being done about incorporating patient preferences into both drug and device development. But generally, the patient is not really considered a consumer by the people developing alternatives to um, conventional dialysis. We can see that it's not due to any malice on the product developer's part, but it's because, the, because of the way the kidney community is structured, there's a lot of incentives to prioritize other stakeholders like health systems or payers over the patient consumer. And what I wanna talk about a little bit about today is the consequences of not thinking through what it means to be a patient consumer and how we can actually start prioritizing the patient consumer. So one way that we can implement this concept of the patient consumer is through human-centered design. And there are a lot of definitions of human-centered design. Generally, when we talk about at ASN, we're thinking about a combination of industrial design, UX, and human factors. Essentially, it is a method of incorporating a person's life and context into how a product is developed. So we wanted to demonstrate the potential of this concept in the kidney community. And this isn't a novel concept. We didn't invent human-centered design, but it's relatively new in the context of the kidney space. And Paul Conway and I thought that we could demonstrate its potential by looking at the example of, of home dialysis. So we published a perspective in CJSON that is online now that you can look at. And uh, we basically asked the question of, we know that we looked at the example of home dialysis because the clinical benefits of home dialysis are generally well accepted now. And we know they can offer people a lot of benefits and improved quality of life and improving their health. But adoption rates are still really low. And there's a lot of people that are doing good work addressing this problem. The ASN has a lot of initiatives around looking at 
this problem from an academic, like a training perspective, and from the perspective of dialysis centers. But we asked, what about how a product is actually designed? And we think there's reason to believe that the low adoption rates of home dialysis and the number of people that we see choosing to go from home dialysis back to the dialysis center indicates that there's some disconnect between how the product is designed and the life and context of the people it's trying to serve. So this is something that we laid out in this paper and we asked the question, could home dialysis adoption sustained use be increased if the product was designed to better fit the needs of people with kidney failure? So that's how we've kind of looked at applying or basically testing the, the feasibility of human centered design in the kidney space. And I think we acknowledge that considering the patient consumer is important and that there are consequences to not considering a patient's preferences and their life in context and product design. That is going to be even more apparent when we look at other innovations that aren't home, that go beyond home dialysis. So going back to what I was talking about, about before, if we're seeing low adoption of an old technology like home dialysis, in part because maybe it could be designed better to fit somebody's life in context, that's going to be even more true when we think about things like artificial kidneys and things that ask people to change their lifestyle even more to fit a technology. And this concept also brings up another implication of thinking about patients as consumers, and that is the difference between technology push and market pull. So a technology push approach to innovation is basically finding an innovation and in like through bench research or through translational research, developing a product and then trying to find an application for it. And some of the disconnects that we see between the patient community and innovators often kind of can be traced back to this approach. It isn't necessarily a bad approach, but it does mean that the innovator has to do a lot more work trying to match their product to its potential market. A way of thinking about innovation that more aligns with thinking about the patient consumer is a market pull approach, which prompts innovators to think more about the problem they're trying to solve, the needs of the different stakeholders they're trying to address, and then developing a solution to that specific problem. And this helps us make sure that the product that is being developed actually meets a well-defined need, because often a product will be developed, and even if it the technology is sound and it works the way it's supposed to, it may miss the market because it isn't solving a problem that the market has. So these are all implications of why it's important to think about kidney failure or people with kidney failure as consumers. And we wanted to validate that a little bit more. Part of my job is talking to people with kidney failure and patient organizations and having them inform how we think about human-centered design. So a couple of things we found talking to patients that validated this gap between, um, we know innovators want to incorporate a patient's preference into their product design, and we know the patients feel like their needs and their lives aren't being incorporated into kidney replacement therapies. So a couple of things that I'll call out here. One of them is we've heard um, many times about people coming into meetings with patients and just having a product that they just wanted a patient's sign off on. That's not incorporating a patient's preference into the product life cycle or really honestly incorporating a patient's preference into their product sign, just asking them for a sign off. Another thing that I think is a signal that an innovator doesn't fully understand the market they're trying to serve is often there's kind of a condescension towards why people would choose to to stay in a dialysis center at all. I think we've done a really good job over the past couple of years, painting a picture of the cost and the burdens and all the symptoms and like the how your health is negatively affected by just being on dialysis. And as a result, I think we've kind of, that may have inadvertently cultivated uh, an atmosphere of like, oh, obviously people want to get off of the center, get out of the center and would obviously want to try something else. And I think there are many reasons why people would choose to stay in the in-center context. And going back to the home dialysis example, there are reasons why people would wanna to choose to be in a center even over being at home, even if being at home would offer better clinical benefits. All this is to say, 
that there seems to be a need for more productive conversations between people with kidney failure and innovators so that innovators understand their needs and transform those needs into design inputs to design better products. And that's the problem we tried to address at the Kidney Health Initiative with our Human Centered Design Toolkit for Kidney Failure. So again, this product was intended to be really narrowly targeted at early stage startups and preclinical innovators who are trying to develop artificial kidneys. And we thought that these groups are still early enough in their product development cycle where patient input can really have a significant impact. We found that talking to like the FDA, that most of the decisions around product design and user needs and use cases and how well a product meets a patient where they're at, those decisions are made for well before a product gets to the FDA. And fortunately, many people who are thinking about alternatives to conventional dialysis are in that very early stage. We can look at the winners of Kidney X competitions, for example, to kind of see all the different options that are out there. But the other big thing we wanted to try to do with this toolkit was change the conversation around artificial kidneys from what technology specifications does an artificial kidney need to have. If you look back at the Kidney Health Initiative's Roadmap for Renal Replacement Therapy that came out in 2018, we outlined a lot of kidney functions and all of the different research and development activities that need to be done for science and technology to be able to duplicate the functions of a kidney. And that is one way of thinking about what an artificial kidney is. We thought another way would be what problems should it solve and how are we expecting it to change the story of someone with kidney failure? And there are a couple of ways that we think that the toolkit offers a unique addition to the conversation around incorporating patient preferences into product development. And the first one is what we've called the innovation scale. So a lot of people have done really good work around cataloging patients' preferences around kidney failure. So we've done a number of projects like this at the Kidney Health Initiative. Uh, the Song Initiative does a lot of good work on this. But what we wanted to try to tackle was how do we organize them? How do we think about these preferences in relation to each other? Because ultimately you need to make decisions. I think we have to acknowledge that trying to do everything trying to address all the problems that a person with kidney failure faces and all their burdens is going to result in a very expensive and very complex product. So innovators need to make choices about what problems they're going to solve. And we wanted to kind of give them a decision tool to help them think about what problems um, they should solve. And we base this innovation scale off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the basic logic of Maslow's is that to achieve a person's highest aspirations, you need to establish their basic needs first. So in the context of um, kidney replacement therapy, if we're going to offer people their highest aspiration, which is to feel free of the burdens of their kidney failure, we need to make sure that the product also addresses some really basic needs, like it needs to be affordable. It needs to make them feel better, not worse. It needs to lessen the burdens on their family. And then it's kind of set up to be able to achieve higher needs as well. So this is a way we tried to think about how we could avoid trade-offs between different needs, because we recognize that all of the needs, there's just a couple of examples listed here, are important, but we wanted to kind of give people a way to be able to map their product onto patients' needs and kind of show what things they're addressing and what things they are not. Now, the next thing that we offered people with kidney failure and innovators that might be helpful is personas or ambassadors. So going back to this concept of market push and technology pull, we want to really push innovators in the kidney space to think about what specific kind of person their product would help. And that's important because going back to the innovation scale, everyone has different burdens. Everyone is facing different needs and different expectations for how they want to live their life. And all those have implications on how a product is built. So a product that may be good for one person might not be good for another. We understand this intuitively with many other decisions we make, but buying a cell phone or buying a car, but just because there hasn't ever been choice in the kidney space, I don't think we have trained our brains to think this way as much. So what we did was we did some qualitative and quantitative research to try to understand the problems facing people with kidney failure. And we constructed 
three different ambassadors or personas that we think represent the spectrum of people with kidney failure who would be interested in an artificial kidney. Now, the three examples that we outlined in the toolkit aren't exhaustive. I think we're exploring some ways that we might add in some different ambassadors to kind of fill up some gaps that we saw. But they do generally, I think, capture the spectrum of people with kidney failure. And what we want to prompt people to do with this information is be able to look at the profiles that we wrote and be able to say, like, my product really serves this type of person and really kind of help people start thinking about market segmentation and the kind of specific people that they want to serve. And the, uh, the third thing that we offer innovators and people with kidney failure in this toolkit is design principles and metrics to really kind of make this whole concept more tangible. So again, going back to trying to shift the conversation away from how a product lines up with the, the functions of a kidney, for example, we wanted to focus in innovators on the emotional result of solving a problem for someone with kidney failure. And that is where our design principles come from. They are related to the problem statements that we identified in our research. And they focus on what is the emotional result of solving that problem. And then we also came up with a number of metrics that provide tangible ways to demonstrate that a product is achieving that emotional result. This is in many ways a reframing of how we think about product development and kidney failure, but I think it's an important reframing because it focuses the conversation and product development on the person with kidney failure and gives us a way to trace a product specifications, which are really important, back up to the problem that a um, product is intended to solve. So if you read the toolkit, it's laid out kind of like a matrix where we identified a number of problems in the ambassador's stories. You can trace those to different design principles and then trace those design principles to different metrics. And that's kind of how we hope to make this a more tangible tool for people with kidney failure and innovators. Before I close, we did a public comment period where we invited people for across stakeholder groups, um, people who are developing artificial kidneys and the patient community and many others to provide comments on the toolkit. And we received a lot of really helpful comments on how to improve the utility of this resource. And we expect to be able to release a version 1.0 incorporating those changes in the fall. And one of those things that we want to want to improve is kind of the connection between these three verticals. So a couple of things. Uh, I know there are many people in the audience who might be new to the idea of being a patient advocate or, um, or newly connected to a patient organization. And I just want to encourage you that your voice matters in the process of product development. Your unique story has a lot of information that's important for innovators to know so they can build something that you will want to use. Don't be uh, discouraged or, or overwhelmed. There are many great patient organizations in the kidney community that have ways that you can get involved. AKP is a really good one. Your voice is really important and your individual story, I think, is important for innovators to know, not just so that they are motivated to work in the kidney space and bring innovation to an area that has lacked it for many decades, but also so that they can take what you say in your story and translate that into design inputs. So it isn't just you being involved, it's not just an exercise in generating sympathy, but we want to generate true empathy that results in changes in how products are developed. So your voice is really important, and I hope you find a way to get involved. If you want to learn about how other patients like you are um, involved in the process of a drug and device development, the Kidney Health Initiative has a patient family partnership council that does a lot of really good work in the space. You can find out more about them on our website, uh, kidneyhealthinitiative.org. And for the innovators and technology developers out there, I just want to encourage you that there are, that's important to involve patients in the whole life cycle of, of your product. Recognize that's difficult to do. Part of what we do at KHI is we talk to people who are early stage innovators and like large industry, and no one has really figured out a really good way of doing this process that I've talked about in this presentation. So we know it's difficult. KHI is here to, to help you. Part of why we put out this toolkit is kind of to give you a tangible tool to help facilitate those conversations, to help you put together agendas for your patient advisory board, to help you figure out what sort of questions to ask 
in your surveys. But the patient perspective is important. I think we all recognize that. The challenge is, I think, incorporating their perspective in meaningful ways throughout the whole process of product development. Thank you for your uh, time and attention to this presentation. If you have any questions, my email is on this slide, uh, zkhill at asn-online.org. And uh, thanks again for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you very much, Zach. We look forward to working with you on other projects along with the American Society of Nephrology.